In 1846, a fungus-like organism with a five-day life cycle turned potatoes into a foul-smelling, inedible mush. Tenant farmers, their entire harvest wiped out. Extreme hunger, starvation and disease ensued, with peasants dying in the hundreds of thousands on the streets, farms and workhouses throughout the land. Ireland, the idyllic Emerald Isle, a land of hard-working, talented and warm-hearted people. But in the mid-1800s, a terrible tragedy was unfolding. The consequences of centuries of unjust laws and practices imposed on Catholic Ireland by Irish oppressors had pauperised the peasants. For survival, Irish tenant farmers relied on potatoes harvested from small plots of land that they were offered in return for working their landlords' large estates, estates which had been formed by the consolidation of land the British had confiscated from the Irish years before. The English Quaker and MP John Bright was an arch-critic of Irish landlords. He was gathering arguments he could use in the British Parliament to restore ownership of land to tenant farmers. Bright's diary entry for September 7, 1849, notes, Call on Count Strzelecki at Reynolds Hotel. Count Strzelecki said, If the devil himself exercised all his ingenuity to invent a scheme which should destroy the country, he could not have contrived anything more effectual than the principles and practices upon which landed property has been held and managed in Ireland. John Bright concluded that, the count is greatly in favour of tenant compensation. It would stimulate labour, would absorb the surplus labour now idle in the workhouses. In 1846, across the Emerald Isle, Phytophthora infestans, a fungus-like organism with a five-day life cycle, turned potatoes into a foul-smelling, inedible mush. Tenant farmers, almost without exception, had their entire harvest wiped out. Although often referred to as the Great Famine, it was not really a famine because non-potato output grown or grazed on large estates was mostly unaffected, but the landlords exported this produce and it was not used to feed the starving. However, even during the worst cases of man's inhumanity to man, there are individuals and groups that act extraordinarily benevolently, virtuously and righteously helping those in dire need. Victims of Angor Tamur were helped by, amongst others, the Society of Friends, Asenath Nicholson, William E. Forster, James Tuke, the Choctaw Indian Nation, and Captain Robert E. Forbes. For example, the Society of Friends set up relief operations such as soup kitchens and broke the story of the tragedy. People around the world donated money and goods to help relieve the suffering. Humanitarian spirit has two-way impartiality. The parable of the Good Samaritan shows kindness, benevolence and compassion may be offered by any human being to any other human being, irrespective of age, gender, religion or culture of either giver or receiver. Humanitarian deeds may be performed even by individuals that may be of the same religion or culture as the wrongdoers. Such was the case when a few English nobles formed the British Relief Association for the purpose of applying donated materials and funds to help save the people starving in Ireland and Scotland. The author Christine Keneally states that The British Relief Association, which, although it never achieved as high a profile as the Quakers, raised approximately £470,000, over double the amount provided by the Society of Friends. In January 1847, Paul Edmund Strzelecki was an early volunteer, and this is the story of his humanitarian work in Ireland. Almost 50 years old, he was a man of character with these useful attributes. Fit, energetic and resilient. Unifying personality. Amenable to Irish and English. Empathy with oppressed. Efficient administrator. Discerning recruiter. Impeccable integrity.
Sir Edmund Strzelecki was born on June 20, 1797 at Gorszyna, a suburb of Poznań in western Poland. Both his parents had distinguished noble lineages, centuries long. As a young man, he became plenipotentiary of grand estates and displayed excellent administrative ability by restoring them to a sound financial position. Sapiecha, the owner, bequeathed Strzelecki a fortune, but the son refused to honour his father's will. Paul Edmund began legal action and received about a quarter of the bequeathed amount in an out-of-court settlement. In 1829, Strzelecki left Poland to explore the world, engaging in geological and mineralogical research as a self-educated scientist. After expeditions to North and South America, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands, he arrived in Australia on the 25th of April, 1839. Over four years, with the help of Aboriginal guides, he travelled about 7,000 miles on foot across tribal territories by permission, not force, peacefully completing four major expeditions. In 1927, the Victorian Historical Society honoured Strzelecki's Gippsland explorations by unveiling seven cairns approximating Paul Edmund's pathfinding route. Some matters worthy of note include discovery of gold, silver, coal and other minerals, climbing and naming Mount Kosciuszka and determining it to be Australia's highest mountain, mapping, naming and reporting about the productive potential of Gippsland opening the region for settlement, advocating large-scale adoption of irrigation, his empathy for the plight of Aboriginals. Strzelecki left Australia on April 23, 1843, journeying across Asia before settling in London, where, in 1845, he published The Physical Description of New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land, accompanied by an extraordinary and detailed geological map 25 feet by 25 feet in dimension, a small version of which is included in his book. In November of 1845, he became a British citizen. Strzelecki, a man of independent means, was touched by the unfolding tragedy. He wanted to do all in his power to help the sick and starving survive. Aware that he had travelled 7,000 miles on foot exploring Australia, the association respected his capabilities and assigned him to the counties of Donegal, Sligo and Mayo, the regions in the western parts of Ireland where hunger was most severe and getting help to the starving was extremely difficult due to poor infrastructure and dispersed settlement. Seeking first-hand knowledge, Strzelecki scouted his district and was horrified by what he was witnessing. At Carrick on Shannon I found the poorhouse and hospital crowded with half-naked and emaciated men, women and children, a prey to dysentery and fever which terminated fatally. The number of daily deaths exceeded the supply of coffins which the place could furnish. Between Carrick and Sligo, numberless, struggling, and ragged families were observed, some crawling, some squatted on the roadside, through utter exhaustion, all bearing downcast, broken and worn-out countenances. Fearful results of starvation, sickness and exposure to the weather. At Sligo, I found the streets swarming with the distressed, clamorous through hunger, the poorhouse presented an awful number of cases of fever and dysentery, which commonly terminated fatally. In the barony of Eris, I have found generally the most melancholy and deplorable destitution amongst the inhabitants, which in many cases proves fatal. The destitution is extending wider and wider. Fever and dysentery become more virulent, fearfully increasing the mortality of the barony. The barony of Ballina Hinch is in as complete a destitution as is Donegal and the barony of Eris, and the inhabitants in as great want of energy, resignation to the calamity and dependence upon foreign relief 
seem to be the only manifestations evident. In March 1847, Strzelecki contracted typhus, and although he suffered ill effects for the rest of his life, he continued organizing relief after his recovery. Mortality from the disease was very high, but Strzelecki attributed his survival to being bled by a village barber applying leeches to his neck. However, it's just as likely his physical fitness pulled him through and he continued to report to the association. No pen can describe the distress by which I'm surrounded. It has actually reached such a degree of lamentable extremes that it becomes above the power of exaggeration and misrepresentation. You may now believe anything which you hear and read because what I actually see surpasses what I ever read of past and present calamities. I'm sorry to report to you that during the last week the distress has become more pressing. Melancholy cases of deaths occurring on public roads and in streets are more frequent. Paul Edmund witnessed the unbearable. He especially took the suffering of the children deeply to heart. Childhood memories awoke. His father died when he was four and his mother six years later. Strzelecki anguished over the permanent scarring the children would suffer from the horrors they experienced and witnessed. Urgency for action was extreme. What to do? Strzelecki's plan of action was simple, innovative and revolutionary. There seemed nothing wrong with the current routine of helping families through parents. Up to this time, it was the normal procedure wherever aid to the destitute was offered around the world. No one anywhere in the world had ever before given it a thought that the relief could be provided in any other way. Strzelecki turned the orthodox wisdom on its head. He changed the focus away from the parents and onto the children, first at Westport, but eventually to every district suffering deep distress. On October 24, 1847, Count Strzelecki wrote to the British Association, the Temporary Relief Act and private and charitable donations, while meeting fully the destitution of the full-grown people, had seldom been instrumental in alleviating that of the helpless children, who, in their general run and scramble for food, had been left behind, hungry, conscious that schools in general will be the most systematic and beneficial machinery. I've distributed clothing and secured one meal daily, of which the cost averaged one third of a penny per head. For the sake of the children, Strzelecki was able to convince Catholic and Protestant clergy to set aside their differences. I took the opinion of both Catholic and Protestant gentlemen upon the subject, and everyone confessed that in these extraordinary and exceptional times, when nakedness and hunger amongst children threatened them with most severe suffering and demoralisation, the assistance in food and clothing given to them through the medium of schools, of whatsoever denomination they may be, cannot be construed either into favouritism or indifference to the principle on which the school is to be conducted. The children located in the most illiterate parts of Ireland not only improved their educational standards, they also learned good hygiene. Every union inspecting officer was requested by Count Strzelecki to require that water, towels, soap and combs are provided at each school at which relief is afforded and that no child be allowed to partake of his ration without having first well washed his face and combed his hair. In June 1847, the association picked Strzelecki to be their chief executive officer, administering and coordinating the relief program. Working from Dublin, he allocated the association's funds and resources to the areas he believed were in most need across Ireland, he did so till the association's funds were exhausted in September 1848. Even in hindsight, it is difficult to believe that Strzelecki's simple idea of feeding and clothing destitute children as a priority would make any difference, but successful it proved to be. The positive effects were immediate and astounding. Workhouses did not have sound hygiene procedures. They were dilapidated, lice-infested and overcrowded. The residents suffered high rates of mortality from famine, fever and dysentery. 
Since the children in the Stiletsky scheme were fed and clothed every day in the schools, they stayed away from disease-infested workhouses and their chances of survival were much higher. There were positive consequences for parents too. A common observation in the reports about schools was the psychological impact the Stiletsky scheme had on parents. Certain that their beloved children would be fed, clothed, taught and looked after every day, they no longer felt paralysed, and to get out of their own dire predicament they began to shift for themselves, thereby also avoiding the disease-infested workhouses. Testimonials to the success of the Stiletsky scheme poured into the association from across Ireland. Community leaders and first responders were astonished by the improvements they witnessed wherever and whenever the scheme became operational. Standish Haley, the secretary of the association, received letters from scheme implementers in the most starving districts of Ireland. Writing independently of each other at different times and from different locations, they came to similar conclusions as to how and why Stoletsky's school scheme succeeded. I'll let you into a little secret. For four months, Stoletsky pleaded for permission from the Committee for the School Scheme he had successfully pioneered in County Mayo to be extended across Ireland. We were reluctant to do so. We wrote to Charles Trevelyan, the Chief of Government Relief Programs, asking him what he thought of Stoletsky's proposal, and he opposed the idea. However, the powerful arguments Stoletsky put to us in his long letter of October 1847 persuaded the committee to give him the go-ahead. We are very pleased he, we did. I received many, many letters from the volunteers implementing the scheme, telling us that the feeding and clothing the children in schools was not only saving them from starvation, but it was helping the parents too. For instance, Colonel Clark of Kohurkaveen noted that no measure is giving more universal satisfaction than that of giving food and clothing to the children of destitute parents attending the existing schools. Dr. Dempster at Ballinrobe said relieved parents told him that now they knew their children would be looked after, they would do all in their power to earn a subsistence rather than go to the work. The Marshal of Skibberine observed that the people are in much better spirits. When a man saw his helpless children crying for something to eat, he was cast down and rendered unable to earn his own bread. But now the case is different. It stimulates the parents to exertion. A Roman Catholic clergyman said since the children are fed, matters are now becoming quite cheering. <laughs> Captain Hotham of Tralee made surprise visits to the schools in his district, and he wrote, It was a great comfort, after seeing the terrible destitution of the country, to witness so many little children happy and healthy amidst the dreadful desolation which surrounds them. Captain Gilbert of Sligo concluded that the benefits are most manifest in decreasing the clamour for relief amongst the adult and able-bodied of the destitute. Many of the paupers have left the workhouse on finding their children would be supported at the schools. Relieved of their anxiety, the parents have endeavoured to shift for themselves. Mr. Dean of Clifton found that, as soon as it became generally known that food was about to be given to the children attending the schools, numbers increased to the full extent for which accommodation could be provided. It is scarcely possible to overestimate the value and importance of the relief afforded to children at the schools. Captain Mann of Kilrush said he couldn't find the words to tell how much benefit is derived from feeding the destitute children at the schools. It prevents the little creatures from starving and improves their habits. 
and leaves the parents free to seek for their own subsistence. Captain O'Manny of Kenmare considered that the benefit derived by this system is very extensive. I am constantly about the country and inspect the schools. When I contrast the children when I first came to the Union with the present, instead of numbers of emaciated children struggling all over the country, there are but very few to be seen now. Mr. Darcy of Ballyshannon let us know. The Board of Guardians expressed their thanks to the Association for the benefit received and to their able and courteous agent, Count Strzelecki, for the great and judicious assistance given to their union through the medium of food distributed to the destitute children in schools. It has been of signal service in reducing the pressure for relief, because so relieved by the bread given to the children, the families have endeavoured to support themselves. After the scheme came to a close and its results were assessed, the commissioners of the association wrote in praise of Strzelecki, as did the chief administrators responsible for running the British government's famine relief programs in Ireland. In June 1849, the British Relief Association raised an additional £6,400 and asked Strzelecki to return to Dublin to use the money to feed and clothe the destitute in Connaught and Munster. His job done, he returned to London in September, and soon after he became an active member of Caroline Chisholm's Family Colonisation Loan Society, Sidney Herbert's Emigration Committee, and the Duke of Wellington's Emigration Organisation helping to promote emigration from Britain and Ireland to Australia. Strzelecki died in London of liver cancer in 1873, and he rests in the crypt of eminent Poles at the Church of St. Adalbert in Poznań, Poland. Sir Paul Edmund Strzelecki worked tirelessly, gratuitously and successfully for nearly two years in the most distressed regions of Ireland, overcoming the typhoid fever he contracted in late March 1847 and continued providing a helping hand to those most in need. The brilliance of Strzelecki's concept in changing the mindset about the way in which relief was provided and the fact that the school scheme was authoritatively assessed as saving more than 200,000 children from starvation is worthy of transcending the 19th century. Furthermore, as Canon John O'Rourke noted in 1847, that whilst so many of those immediately connected with this gigantic work laboured gratuitously, the whole expense of management was only £12,000, barely 2%. Paul Edmund wanted to make sure that the limited and precious resources, so compassionately donated to the association to help the starving, reached their target to the maximum possible. From his plenipotentiary experiences, he had a discerning eye in recruiting honest, hard-working and capable volunteers to instill and run his innovative scheme. As a result, more than 98% of the materials and funds under Strzelecki's administration went directly to assist those in most need, a stark contrast to the chronic waste and corruption in the British government's programs, and even nowadays some of Australia's most prominent charities spend more than 40% on administrative costs. Internationally, billions of dollars disappeared in the scandalous UN Oil for Food program. Strzelecki's humanitarian deeds had won the hearts and minds of the people of his day, and he was deeply respected at the highest levels. Barely two months after he returned to London, on November 21, 1848, he was knighted for his noble actions by Queen Victoria. However, in modern times, he's best known for his exploration and scientific work, having been awarded the Founders Gold Medal of the Royal Geographic Society, fellowships to the Royal Geographic Society and to the Royal Society, and an honorary doctorate of civil law from Oxford University. Nevertheless, all the firsts he achieved in his non-humanitarian activities would have been accomplished by someone else later. A starving child cannot wait. A premature death is still a death forever. What is the value of a single human life? Strzelecki was responsible for saving hundreds of thousands of children from starvation and deserves to be honoured intergenerationally. <laughs>